I'm uh, Victor DeMassey, and I'm uh, here tonight to talk about pollinators in my backyard. And I'm from Connecticut, but our place is very much like yours. So I think uh, you can share our uh, similar backgrounds. So I'm going to start my show right now. Uh, so please uh, make contact if it doesn't come up. Okay, should be starting. Okay. And... Okay, here we go. This is, uh, we're going to talk about pollinators tonight. I, I kind of started out uh, my entomological interest in uh, butterflies. So I'm well known, well known for my butterfly work, but uh, uh, recently I've become very interested in po all pollinating insects. And uh, we'll talk about that as we go on tonight is something we should know more about them. And I'm uh, representing in many ways a group called Pollinator Pathway. And what our goal is, is to start to restore uh, and protect some of the just natural fields and open space areas with flowers that pollinators need to, uh, you know, may, uh, make their honey or whatever other activities they're up to. This has become very important. Uh, now, one of the things you want to ask, of course, is, you know, who am I to be telling you about pollinators? You know, you might already think you know a lot about it. And really, my background in lepidoptery, which is my primary interest in insects, goes back to uh, English about 1750. And uh, English people then loved to travel to Italy. And, uh, you know, they would uh, go to Italy. They, they didn't care much for the Italians, but they uh, liked the countryside. And here is a uh, Englishman uh, demonstrating his interest in the collection of butterflies. And it is the fly catching macaroni. Macaroni being a term for kind of uh, silly uh, people. Uh, remember Yankee Doodle uh, went to town riding on a pony when he stuck the feather in his hat, they called them macaroni. So macaroni is, uh, you know, it's kind of a derogative term back then. But going forward, we can see that, you know, I have the Italian name and I have the uh, fly, I'm catching the flies and stuff. So I'm um, kind of the incarnation of the uh, present day macaroni. So that's why I'm qualified to tell you what I'm gonna tell you tonight. Now my spouse and I, we've been all over the world uh, collecting insects for the Peabody Museum at Yale. Here we are flying over the island of Montserrat when there was a, uh, a an erupting volcano. You can see this, this is something to look out the window and see that. And of course now, uh, this was some years ago, they wouldn't allow that now because they're conscious of the dust uh, you know, destroying the airplane engines. So I'm more uh, stuck in Connecticut these days, uh, not only because of the pandemic last year, but uh, just, uh, you know, we have a wonderful background uh, here in Connecticut, much like you do in the Hudson Valley. I, I love the Hudson Valley. Uh, I go up to Saugerties, New York all the time and uh, just wonderful uh, backyards. And, uh, you know, years ago, our May, our, uh, Governor Ella Grasso, they were comment, commenting about how Connecticut doesn't have lakes like the Committee, the Grand Canyon, but but we have our beauty in our back in our backyards. So we're going to go to my backyard today and see what we can learn about pollinators. Now, when you look out my attic window, this is uh you know what you see. This is our meadow where uh, over the course, that's my wonderful spouse, Joanna, who's been my constant companion in my 45 years in Connecticut. And over 45 years, we've managed to document almost half the state fauna of Connecticut in the backyard of our uh, house. And you can see here, maybe you recognize some of these, the monarch in the middle, the viceroy below it, the tiger swallowtail, all wonderful uh, butterflies we have living with us. Now, getting back to the issue of pollen, okay, this is how pollination works. It's the same old male-female thing that we have in humans. The sperm has to go to the egg, and the uh, anther, uh, or the pollen is the sperm, and it's carried by some agent, uh, in this case, a butterfly, to where the egg is, and then down at the bottom, you can see the egg uh, where it's gonna get uh, uh, fertilized. Now, don't get that confused with wind pollen. Uh, many uh, plants are pollinated by the wind and um, 
the, you know, especially grasses and oak trees are wind pollinated. They, they don't need any, uh, any pollinators working on them at all. Although recently oak, which was always thought to be not necessary to have uh, pollinating agents has come under new scrutiny and there might be spring insects uh, contributing to success. This is what uh, pollen looks like in Connecticut. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I sure there's some allergy sufferers in the uh, in the audience there, and it can just be really thick. I went out to my truck this morning, and it has a has a sandbar of uh, pollen that has been washing down the hood and just forming this hard uh, thing. Here's here's a really bad case of uh, pollen, and again, you energy, you allergy sufferers must be really uh, shuddering. I know I am. Don't get wind pollination confused with wind dispersal. Things like the um, uh, you know, dandelion has these little, little parachutes and they blow around in the wind uh, and get blown to a new place where the seeds can find a, a fertile ground. But wind pollination is different than wind dispersal. A plant could be pollinated by insects and then the seeds have parachutes and it's dispersed by the wind. Milkweeds are a very good example. Here's our typical well-known pollinator at work, uh, the uh, domestic bee, and it's got a big, big pollen, uh, pollen um, ball on its hind uh, femora. And one of the things you can see this, that these, are, this is one of the characteristics of um, uh, pollinating insects and especially the bee family that they have this, uh, this enlarged hind leg that they use to uh, grab uh, pollen or they collect pollen as they go from plant to pl uh, anther to uh, stamen and the like. But, uh, you know, it, it's a little simplistic to the, the bees pollinators, we all know them, but there are a lot of agents out there that can aid in pollination. Some plants have specialty pollinators. They're not pollinated by anything else. This especially becomes true in the tropics. And, but these are some of the agents that have all been shown to be active pollinators. So uh, for our sake, uh, it's a good idea to have some of these things around. Okay. So look at that. Ants, flies, beetles, mosquitoes can be pollinators of some rare plants are pollinated by mosquitoes, moths, butterflies, bees, bats, birds, and wasps, all pollinators. So when we look at the plant world, we find that 75% of our pollination is active pollination by agents such as insects or butterfly, insect uh, bees and butterflies or birds. And uh, you know, you, you see the hummingbird going to the deep uh, corolla flowers. That's doing some pollinating there. That's a great example of a bird pollinator. So you can see that only wind is carrying. Uh, 25% of our pollinating uh, work. And that is kind of, um, you know, something to be concerned about because in recent years, uh, in insects have been declining. And uh, we're gonna talk a little about why we don't wanna see our bugs go away. Now here is Monarda. That's the one I was just telling you about, bee bomb. This is pollinated by uh, hummingbirds and spice bush swallowtails. I uh, love that they really favor the uh, red uh, uh, flowers. Uh, spice bush swallowtail, which is a big black swallowtail. I studied swallowtails for 23 years and I noted that they really like any flowers that are red and the flowers that are red tend to have very deep, um, you know, corollas. So they have to have a, a long, long way to reach in there and, and get some uh, nectar. Here is the hummingbirds there at Cardinal Flower, a uh, real great beauty. I'm sure you have this down in your area too. Uh, think about Cardinal Flower, once very common and so beautiful that people picked it all up. So uh, it's hard, not, not easy to find a Cardinal Flower. And if you have a spot where you have it, uh, treasure it because it's an absolutely beautiful uh, member of the Lobelia family. And here is the spice bush swallowtail. Uh, knee deep in a in a in a flower, uh, really, and look at the pollen. You can see those brushes are made to just dust that that uh, uh, that's a female, uh, a male uh, 
spice bush. And that male is going to carry a lot of pollen to the next flower he visits. A uh, milkweed family is really a uh, great plants. If you're planning uh, native uh, restoration of plants, milkweed is a good place to start. Kind of ironic, uh, milkweed is a highly poisonous plant. Uh, so don't go eating it. I didn't think you would, but um, it was used in colonial times for pyrazidine alkaloid. Uh, for heart murmurs and very telltale if you break a leaf off a milkweed the white milky pyrazidine alkaloid immediately comes to streaming out uh milkweed this is the common milkweed which is the one you most see it's why it's called the most common but we're going to look at a few others and in our promoting native uh, habitat in uh, meadows we are uh, emphasizing milkweeds here is the swamp milkweed uh, tending to more wetter areas, but going up on the dry slopes. I have a little dry mound in my uh, field and I got some swamps that are doing great out there, but the leaves are light now, much narrower and beautiful uh, pink flowers when they come around. And here's uh, the monarch butterfly. Now the monarch, as we'll learn, we'll study this a little later, monarch loves milkweeds because not only the nectar is a great source of uh, energy, but the caterpillars eat the milkweed plants exclusively. Nothing, monarch caterpillars cannot eat anything else but milkweed. So uh, hence the big effort recently to uh, uh, promote milkweed, uh, you know, planting around the country. There used to be tons of milkweed in the Midwest where farmers would leave conservation strips between their fields. But when corn got uh, popular for addition to fuel, uh, all of those, thick areas of weeds that used to uh, be between dividing fields uh, have been eliminated. They, they plow fence to fence now. So huge crash in the uh, monarchs in the Midwest. Here's the purple milkweed, absolutely stunning. It's a rare plant. Uh, we have a couple in our meadow and we've obtained seeds of a, a bunch of them and are now uh, planting them. But uh, I think you're in the zone for purple milkweed and it's absolutely beautiful. Uh, look at the Leaves. If you look at the telltale thing for purple milkweed, is the leaf edge is wavy. It doesn't have a straight edge like a lot of uh, leaves. Now, uh, what we did uh, because we're concerned about pollinators last year during the height of the pandemic, I organized uh, with this young woman, Sammy uh, Riccio, who a wonderful young entomologist who's graduated from college. We organized a um, a pollinator survey. And what we did is in my meadow and in uh, uh, another meadow that Sammy specialized in, we went out every week and uh, uh, collected different pollinating insects that were there. And it made a collection that is now going to the Peabody Museum at Yale that as far as we know is the first complete season collection of uh, any particular meadow. The idea with this is that it will be a standard that you know, say you come to me and say, uh, you know, Victor, how's my meadow doing? Well, we can see what's in your meadow and compare it to what we consider two, two, two good meadows in uh, Connecticut. And I took on a young uh, helper, uh, Lucas Curris, and you can see he's uh, learning his tick, uh, learning his tick care. He's got his socks uh, tucked in. He's a little mini me and a really 13 year old kid who's a great entomologist and worked with us all summer. And by the end of the summer, he was doing all the field work and I was watching from my uh, resting chair in my backyard. Uh, one of the things we discovered were really fantastic moths, hummingbird moths, uh, going back to that red uh, Minarda bee bomb. Uh, one of the things you see there, not only hummingbirds, but you see hummingbird moths. They can also reach into those deep uh, flowers for nectar. And uh, a lot of people think they're hummingbirds. They make a good uh, stab at it. They're representative of it for sure. Uh, another thing we're uh, looking at are bumblebees. And we have or had in Connecticut 14 species of bumblebees. Uh, bumblebees are really carrying a lot of the weight of the non uh, domestic bee pollinating that's going on. So uh, we're gonna keep an eye on the honey, on the, on the bumblebees. Uh, a number of species have declined like this, uh, this particular absolutely beautiful uh, russet brown bumblebee. Another bumblebee from the side, you can see the enlarged hind leg. 
They're wonderful uh, pollinators that's covered with hair. It's just going to, uh, in half an hour from now, this, this bug's going to have a big ball of pollen there when it heads back to its uh, nest. Here you can see that's the uh, ball of pollen on the leg. This is the common uh, bumblebee, uh, uh, Bombus impatiens. And uh, here he is visiting, or she, I'm sorry, it's a she. Um, here she's visiting a uh, flower. Now, when we talk about butterfly gardening, and that's become a big word in recent years, we're, we're not really talking just about uh, supplying the uh, nectar uh, for, the, for the insects. And also it has to be a safe place for insects. Uh, you can't be you know, dumping a bunch of uh, seven or other pesticides on your garden and expect to have any insects in there. So let's uh, talk a little about, I wanna go into what's happening to some of our native butterflies, which are pollinators. We don't know how important they are as pollinators, but they're definitely in the game. And I wanna uh, look at the, go back to high school or grade school and look at the life cycle. Here you have the eggs of the butterfly. Here you have the caterpillar of the butterfly, which comes out, maybe feeds for six weeks, and then it turns into a chrysalis, which is this, uh, you know, similar to a cocoon. Uh, same, same idea where the, all the tissue in the body is reorganized in that caterpillar and it emerges as a butterfly. Now, just think about this. This is the most amazing thing in nature to me. Uh, if you were come from Mars and you were said to document life on Earth, you would very quickly note that little versions look like big versions. For instance, a, a little boy looks like a man. Uh, you know, a little plant looks like a big plant. Would you ever connect a caterpillar with a butterfly? Like, no way, I say, because that is such a totally different look. And that metamorphosis is the most incredible uh, process in nature. And, and think about it. You know, I, when I was a kid, I took the, one of these caterpillars and squished it. And, you know, a lot of black gunk came out. I'm, I'm sorry, not the caterpillar, the chrysalis down below. And so, I mean, if you open that up, there's no, no indication that that's going to be a butterfly coming out of that. And a whole genetic reorganization takes place from the caterpillar, making it into a butterfly. Really a truly uh, unique uh, process in the world, in, in the uh, natural world. Here, uh, eggs are indicative of the species of butterfly. Here we have the uh, comma butterfly, and here are the eggs. This is actually an upside down shot. These eggs are underneath on a leaf. And, uh, you know, working, uh, hanging out at the museum, this is where you really get sometimes to do, do the most exciting things uh, for a naturalist. They were cleaning some uh, plant material from the Jurassic and the sand and stuff that came off. They put it under an electron microscope just to see what it looked like. And they found some moth eggs from the Jurassic, the earliest known, uh, you know, Lepidoptera eggs there are known. And that was a friend of mine, Larry Gall. That pushed egg age back from about, you know, 50 million years to like, you know, 60, I mean, 50,000 years back to like 60 million years. It was really an incredible leap and just what an exciting discovery to be around. So uh, here is the caterpillar, very, very striking. This is the uh, caterpillar of the pipeline swallowtail. Now, this butterfly is very rare in Connecticut. Uh, I think you guys probably have some populations down there, so you might be seeing it, uh, which makes me envious. And this butterfly is a uh, very poisonous uh, because it feeds on a plant called Dutchman's pipe, which has poisonous uh, elements to it, poison chemicals. And the caterpillar, instead of feigning away from it, actually ingests the poisons and uses them in its defense. So. Uh, predators like birds aren't going to come along and munch on this thing because it's advertising that it doesn't taste very well. Here's the uh, actual metamorphosis itself taking place. And here's a fully formed monarch coming out that was a caterpillar just uh, a couple of days before. So, I mean, really just, again, the most incredible process. If you get a chance to ever see this all the way through, it's, it's a delight. And here is the chrysalis in nature. This is the tiger swallowtail chrysalis, a common large yellow and black butterfly you probably see around your yard uh, pretty soon anyway. 
and uh, they the chrysalis becomes the color of the surrounding. It can be anything from brown to green, depending on what's appropriate for where that uh, chrysalis is is hiding. It wants to not be seen by predators. And now uh, this is again something that uh, you know, being a little farther south than Connecticut, uh, you probably experienced the butterfly in greater numbers and sooner than we did. But this is the giant swallowtail, and it's really a terrific uh, large butterfly, unmistakable, bigger than our other uh, swallowtails. And this thing goes all the way to the tropics, and I had seen it uh, commonly uh, in trips to Central and South America, but um, it's been showing up in Connecticut now. And this is where understanding the biology of the insect tells us what's happening. Uh, this giant swallowtail feeds on a plant called xanthoxylum or commonly prickly ash. And that plant uh, grows up to Connecticut, no problem. But the problem with the prickly ash is it turns to mush with the first frost. I've seen you, you know, you've seen this in your yard or something when that frost comes and all of a sudden the whole thing's turned black and mushy. So uh, this, this butterfly uh, has two life cycles a summer. One is in the high summer, it is an adult that lays eggs that feed until the late uh, September, and then they will become chrysalises and go through the winter. Now, what has happened is that as uh, temperatures are increasing, we no longer get a frost in September or early October. We don't get, I don't think last year we had one until November. So the prickly air that is around now lives healthily and the caterpillars keep uh, going on. So uh, I see Diane, your, your thing is up. Are you signaling me for any reason or not? No, I'm gonna keep going. Okay, let's see. Okay. Where's the chat? I'm just gonna check that out. Okay, so uh, keep going here. So we have a condition where, uh, you know, the climate change is bringing some new species into our area. In this case, a spectacular butterfly uh, this butterfly uh, got into Connecticut in the mid 50s, 1950s, and it hung out for a few years. And I, I don't know the weather particularly, but they had, uh, uh, you know, frost, earlier frost that set the food plant back, and as a result, the butterfly disappeared. But now it's uh, coming back and is a regular resident in Connecticut. I still have not seen one in Connecticut. So it kind of burns me up when people call me up and they, you know, they're bragging about seeing one. Uh, I'm hoping to see one soon so I can join that club. But I have, as I said, I have seen them elsewhere. Now, here we are in the jungles in French Guiana. And, and one of the things uh, we just learned from the giant's wild tail is that butterflies have particular uh, tastes. Each butterfly generally feeds on one or a limited number of plants in a related family like that white uh, uh, cabbage butterfly that you see out in your yard, that feeds on a cabbage family. So it can be broccoli, it can be cabbage, it can be Brussels sprouts, and hence it does become a pest in some uh, regard. But the main thing about butterflies is that the more plants you have, the more kind of plants you have, the more chance you have to have different butterflies that are specialized on those plants. And that's why tropical forests are just, you know, just, uh, you know, just packed with uh, different species of butterflies. Here, as I walk into the jungle in French Guiana, in this particular area on one acre, the same tree is seldom, if ever, seen twice. Now think about the forest in New York. You probably have oaks and, you know, maples and whatever. And as you walk through the forest, you see them you know, uh, six, six trees you have there, you see them over and over again. Here, you can't find the second tree twice. In fact, some people have never, the trees aren't even described in science yet. So now here's where the butterfly gardener uh, departs from the regular gardener. I go out in my yard and I see this, uh, these chew marks on my little plants and I'm excited because you know what? That might be some new moth or butterfly or something else that I've got uh, going in my uh, garden. So I am promoting uh, the eating of plants to a certain degree. Let's study uh, how that uh, particular 
uh, aspect of being specialized on plants has affected some of our fauna in a negative sense, not a positive sense. Uh, this is the West Virginia white. This is, was a common butterfly in the Northeast in very deep forests in places like uh, maple forests, in cooler elevation, probably up in the Pocono Mountains, those kind of places. And uh, I had one near me in Reading, a colony. Uh, the adults, now this is not the cabbage butterfly. It's a cousin of the cabbage butterfly, but it is not. It's the American West Virginia white. And this butterfly uh, comes out in middle of April and flies around in dense forest, which in the middle of April has a lot of sun because the trees haven't leafed out. And it feeds on a very special plant that grows in these far types of forests called denterium. And it will only lay its eggs on denterium. Here is a female, she's touching down, she's scratching the leaf with her little tarsus claw to taste it and see because they have taste in their feet and they could see if that's the right uh, chemical to uh, lay their egg there. Now, what has happened, we had an invader from uh, Central Asia called garlic mustard. And again, I think that's a plant you probably are battling in New York as we, as we are in Connecticut. It's a white uh, member of the cabbage family that's very invasive and comes out in uh, spring. And so by second week of April, uh, April you usually got a a white sea of uh, garlic mustard where they've gotten in a few years before. Now in, in Reading, they were sanding where I live, they were sanding the roads very heavy in the winter and the sand washes off the roads when you get storms. And some of those, some of that sand got pushed way into the forest on a little stream, right into where my West Virginia whites were. And the next thing you know, garlic mustard loves those sandbars and it's growing in the middle of a forest. I mean, you just couldn't imagine it being there. And the West Virginia white comes along and the garlic mustard here, but here's the caterpillar. It, it's now the egg has been laid on the wrong plant. It's a member of the cabbage family. It's got the right chemical signal, but it's not really an adequate food plant. It's not known from this butterfly in all its evolution. So the caterpillar has to specialize on the denterium, and instead it's going to the garlic mustard to lay its eggs, and those little caterpillars are gonna come out and starve. So uh, that's the way I lost my colony uh, in Connecticut in the middle of a forest where it seemed like the butterfly was safe. Here forms huge stands and five or six foot high plants, and uh, you know just another un uninvited European invader or Central Asian invader that we really would not try to have. Now, one of the things we want to talk about because it's so popular is the monarch butterfly. Monarchs are broken to some degree. They've been in the paper a lot. Uh, population, huge population, mid-century, last century has now dwindled to several hundred million, which is still substantial, but uh, alarming when you think that it was one six billion uh, in people's lifetimes here. And uh, what's happened with the monarch is kind of the perfect storm of things going wrong. Okay, so let's talk about this. Um, here we have the monarch. What's incredible about the monarch is its migration. Uh, all the monarchs that we see east of the Rocky Mountains go to an area in central Mexico, a mountain range there. And in the spring, those monarchs overwinter and, and, and go into a torpor and hang from the trees when it was in the billions and even now in the millions, it just weighs the trees down. You go there, it's nothing but monarchs. I mean, million monarchs on a tree. In the spring, the monarchs warm up and they start a migration north. The first batch of monarchs, where you see the first arrowheads, get into kind of the central south and they lay their eggs there. And those eggs on milkweeds, those eggs develop into adults in maybe six weeks. And then they continue the migration north. And we see them coming into our area in Connecticut and, and Hudson Valley around generally about the 15th of May is the earliest you could hope to see a monarch. They're looking for your milkweeds and they'll lay some eggs there and they'll develop, some of those will develop into adults and they will continue the migration north, some up as far as Prince Edward Islands and, and Quebec. And then in September, okay, when things start to change, all the monarchs in 
North America and Eastern North America, Eastern Rockies, turn around and go back to that central location in Mexico. What's incredible about this process is that each that is genetically imprinted for these butterflies in the first, second, and third generation to continue north, and in maybe the fifth generation to all of a sudden turn around and go back to a place that they've never been that's five generations away. Just think about you thinking, you know, remembering something that happened in your family five generations ago. We, we, we spend a lot of time trying to figure that out. So anyway, these monarchs uh, have an incredible lifespan where the, uh, the re memory of migration is not taught, but passed genetically. And it's more complicated than bird migration. So, uh, you know, for you bird watchers out there, don't, don't go blasting off about birds. This is this is really something else. If I didn't have metamorphosis, this would be my, my favorite thing about insects. Anyway, so in September, all those monarchs get together and all go back to Mexico. And sometimes on a beautiful September day, go out on your lawn and lay down and look up and you'll see all these little orange things uh, heading south, southwest. And they're all going to Mexico and uh, nothing's going to stop them. Now, you know, think about this monarch as an incredibly tough beast. People think butterflies are fragile. Well, you know, I take, I do butterfly walks. I take little groups out in the field and we see the butterflies and maybe catch one and let it go and look at it. And I often will catch a monarch and I'll take the monarch and I'll just crush it in my, my uh, fist. And everybody goes, oh, oh they're just like, the shock, I'm going to ruin that butterfly. And I open it up and that monarch just gets up and flies off like it's never been harmed. Uh, these are tough animals. And really, you know, think about it. To fly from Prince Edward Island to central Mexico, I mean, you can't be a pansy to do that. you got to really be pretty tough. Uh, so uh, really incredible uh, biology of this organism. And here's the caterpillar. And as I was saying about the specialty, uh, you know, the different insects, uh, butterflies and moths uh, specialize on different plants. The monarch specialize on the milkweed family, which we looked at a couple of milkweeds earlier. And uh, these caterpillars, as a result, they're very brightly colored. They're advertising. They're not afraid of getting eaten because anything that eats them is going to get sick. And uh, they're specializing. Here's the beautiful butterfly weed, which is a member of the milkweed family. And not only do the milkweeds provide food, specialized food for monarchs, but they also provide nectar for a host of, uh, of uh, pollinating insects. Great, uh, great meadow plant. And just think 100 years ago, farmers were killing themselves to get rid of these things. So times change. Anyway, here's one of the problems we had in our meadow. Uh, you come along now, I told you that if you break the leaf off of milkweed family like butterfly weed or uh, almond milkweed that the white milk comes out. And in this particular, this is a plant called black swallowwort. And black swallowwort is an invader from Central Asia. And it came in and it's, I first one I saw in our meadow was about 1981. And I was all excited to have a new plant. And within uh, a few years, you can see this thing reproduces just unbelievable amounts of seed and can take over very quickly. This is a black swallowwort and it climbs on other plants and strangles them and causes the whole meadow to fall down kind of. And this within a few years of black swallowwort uh, appearing in my meadow, this is what we got out of it. So uh, this is one of our big battles of our lifetime is uh, this plant. Now, uh, University of Rhode Island came along and standing next to me in the field is uh, Lisa Tewksbury of the University of Rhode Island. And she does something called biological control. And what that is, is that you go to the place where the insect came from. In this case, it was, we went to central Ukraine and uh, find something that eats it and then bring it here and test it for 10 years, make sure it doesn't eat anything else and then let it go. And here we are letting the uh, Hypena uh, opulenta, a moth that was found to feed uh, heavily on um, on black swallowwort in the Ukraine. Here she is with her helper and a member of the local conservation commission, Susan Robinson. And we're setting up on my property 
because I had such a huge amount of black swallowwort. And this is what the black swallowwort looks like in my field because you can see there's very little damage. Nothing's eating this plant. Uh, and and uh, we've erected a tent, okay? And this is a tent. If you look, you can very faintly see the uh, a shadow of Susan Robinson on the other side of the tent, big tent in the field. And we let some caterpillars go from the central Ukraine and they started eating it. And boy, did they like my black swallowwort. They uh, have stripped it. You can see the leaf uh, veins there. They, they stripped all the green stuff off the leaf. So they're successfully feeding at this point. And what we're hoping is that uh, they would get established. And uh, this, we started this program three years ago. This is the moth. We hope to see lots of these soon. Uh, we couldn't find any last year, but sometimes these Biological controls take some years to build up their uh, population to, until they do serious damage to the plant that's being targeted. Uh, but this this butter, this uh, moth was uh, experimented with for 10 years on different plants before they were satisfied that it was only going to eat the black swallowwort, which is a specialist on. So here's how the biology of uh, you know specialization of feeding is maybe working to our benefit to some degree. Uh, one of the things uh, with these plants that we have, these invasive plants, they're causing some radical changes in our environment that are causing some of our butterflies to go away, like this Harris checker spot. I had the Harris checker spot uh, in my backyard in our field for years, but the uh, area where it was uh, feeding on dock uh, has kind of disappeared. So, and, and Harris, we haven't seen Harris in about 15 years. We're hoping maybe up again. And uh, one of the big enemies of Harris checker spot is Phragmites. This is a, one of our bad uh, invaders. Uh, it's a plant that's native to the Danube Delta and it's used extensively, the European rush. It's used extensively for thatching huts in Europe, so it is valuable. But uh, another plant that's come in from Europe that's a real beauty and was actually promoted by garden clubs for years is purple loosestrife. Uh, when I was a kid, there was no purple loose strife in the Hudson. Now, if you go from Danbury, Connecticut to uh, uh, Newburgh, New York in, uh, in August, you'll just see whole wetlands that are clogged with this uh, beautiful flower, but doesn't entertain many local uh, uh, nectaring insects and uh, crowds out native vegetation. Now, I just uh, wanted to talk about uh, for a moment uh, um, uh, Henry Bates. Henry Bates is, uh, it's kind of his anniversary and there was a big show going on at the, uh, Met, uh, on the uh, Met Natural History Museum in New York uh, before everything got closed down. Uh, and Henry Bates went to the Amazon in the 1840s when it was still, I mean, just total frontier. And uh, he was one of the first uh, European entomologists to really study tropical insects. And he stayed there for years and, uh, really made beauty, he was a wonderful artist and he made uh, wonderful notebooks with color illustrations of the species he was uh, collecting to send back to Europe. And these have recently been uh, published for the first time uh, as you know, the common folk can see them, you can go buy a copy. And uh, if you're interested in natural history and the history of natural history, fascinating, his book uh, on the rivers Amazon is a, is a real treat a real read and some of the suffering he went through, uh, you know, without modern medicine and stuff. But uh, this shows you, I just want to show you, go back to, uh, you know, our early uh, show here where I showed you a box of butterflies from my uh, field. That was about um, 50 different species. <clears throat> and that's about half the Connecticut fauna. Now to get those 50 species, okay, it took me 40 years for nine before a lot of those butterflies turn up because a lot of them will only turn up for one or two years. This collection is from the Amazon in Ecuador, and this took about an hour to make this collection. So this is a great example of, of uh, uh, temperate diversity versus tropical. One hour, 40 years. So uh, when people talk about butterflies in the Amazon, they're not kidding. And this is what uh, Henry Bates 
studying and, and made a lot of our first descriptions. And Henry Bates was the person who came up with the idea that some butterflies were poisonous, perhaps because they were feeding on poisonous plants. And here is um, the, the monarch caterpillar again, and it's munching a milkweed happily. Uh, if you chewed that milkweed, you'd get pretty sick uh, and, and vomit and stuff. So along this, uh, why we remember Henry Bates is for his uh, description of a phenomenon called Batesian mimicry. And on the top, we have the monarch butterfly, which is a poisonous butterfly because of the milkweeds that it feeds on. Below, we have the viceroy butterfly, which is a perfectly tasty butterfly. I mean, you could eat this, no problem, not get sick. And uh, it looks like the monarch. So birds and predators, have. it's been shown that they won't touch this uh, butterfly if they've had some experience with the, the poisonous one. Uh, this was proven in a very elegant experiment where monarchs were fed uh, to a bird and it ate them and got sick. And then when a viceroy was presented, the bird wouldn't touch it. When the experiment was carried the other way, the viceroys were uh, presented first. The, the birds were happily eating viceroys. And then along came a monarch and they got sick and were retching and wouldn't touch the next time they were offered a viceroy. So a really interesting observation of the phenomena that has to be on nature with mimicry, looking like something that uh, is undesirable to predators. Uh, this is a good example of that carrying into our pollinating insects that we've been studying. On the left, you have a fly, which is perfectly edible uh, insect. And on the right, you have a wasp, which is a you know horrible stinging insect. I am quite susceptible to uh, being hornet stings now, having done many years of field work. So uh, this is especially uh, one of the difference between what's a fly and what's a, a wasp. But they, they're pretty good. The fly on the left is a pretty good mimic of the wasp. And uh, here you have a, a poisonous wasp, uh, not poisonous, uh, bad stinging, you know, aggressive. And here you have the fly. Now, I wanna show you the difference. Look at the fly. It's got very, very short antenna and it only has two wings. The, the uh, yellow jacket has four wings and very long antennas with about 13 segments. So, uh, you know, unless you're a bird doing antenna segment counting, uh, you better steer clear of this little group because you don't know what you might be getting into. So very effective uh, mimic, this is a hoverfly. And these incidentally are very important uh, pollinators. And the reason I'm going into this is that this, this uh, process of Batesian mimicry which Henry Bates came up on the Amazon is happening right in our backyard commonly. So uh, really elucidate the wonderful biological uh, uh, phenomena. And the beetles get in on the act. Here's a beetle with the black and yellow uh, warning coloration of uh, wasps and stuff. Perfectly edible beetle. Uh, eat one, don't worry about it, uh, but make sure you got the right one. But again, look at the antenna on this uh, one. It's got about 13 to 15 segments on the antenna. Now, you know, one of the things we're, we're uh, gotta start thinking about our bugs because we're losing bugs. And why is this happening? People are turning everything into lawn. Uh, if you live in the town I live in, Reading, it was a relatively rural town when I moved here 40 years ago, the amount of wonderful fields that have been turned into lawns and the huge lawning equipment and everything that's going on. I mean, it's just been a total transformation of the landscape. The forest is still there, but the, the lawns have replaced the fields that had the pollinators and the pollinating insects. Now, we've got to come to a new thought process about bugs. It, it's not something just to kill. And let's go back and look at the history of birds. If you go back around 1900, there was the uh, Christmas bird hunt. And everyone went out at Christmas and around Christmas time and killed as many birds as they could. And there's, there's pictures of farmers and you know field people out with the side of a building covered with a hundred small, you know, uh, robins and whatever birds they could find, not only the big uh, hawks and stuff. So this is the idea of the Christmas bird hunt. And this really, uh, this was turned on very heavily by the budding uh, ornithology group. Uh, women uh, hats used up so many bird feathers that birds were 
birds were starting to go extinct, uh, the egrets and stuff. So uh, this really a big public change. And now we, we uh, have birds. And if I went out and collected 10 birds and hung them on the side of my house, I think half the people in Reading would stop by with sticks and beat me. Uh, but, uh, you know, we are concerned uh, about all those birds that were killed. And another thing, bug zappers. Here is an indiscriminate thing that's killing every insect in your backyard. Uh, you know, wondering why there's not so many moths anymore back there. Well, you know, they run into this thing and it's another fizz. You really need to kill every insect in there. There's all of that and that's like kind of killing every bird, especially since those insects are providing about 75% of our pollinating services. So I think this is a public thing that we really have to get people uh, changing uh, their minds about how they uh, think about bugs, uh, you know, just not something to go to Home Depot and get some uh, spray to put it on, especially some of the things that are coming out about pesticides uh, too recently. Uh, and invasive plants, here we have the uh, Phragmites, that European reed that I was talking about, and it has formed a complete stand. What was what once a nice diverse wetland uh, is uh, now just Phragmites, and this thing doesn't provide any pollen for pollinators, and it doesn't really provide uh, much habitat for birds either for the diversity. Uh, this is what a good meadow looks like. So let's just go back and compare. This is what a meadow, it's lawn down to the edge of the wetland, and then the wetland is just overrun by uh, Phragmites. And this is a nice meadow, which has a large diversity uh, in August here. We're with the goldenrod season, wonderful plant, pollinators. Uh, it's full of uh, what we do in our pollinator survey last year. Uh, we goldenrod by far turned out the most diverse uh, groups of insects. And that's what replaces it. And that's what we're seeing more and more of in Reading. So not only is this expensive to maintain, but uh, you know we're, we're, we are suffering the loss of our insects and you know, you can feed the birds all you want, but when spring rolls around, half those birds that are feeder in the winter, they need protein. And if there's no insects around, they're not going to have the protein that they need to feed their young. So it's important uh, for birds too to have uh, insects. And, you know, we're just, uh, for being so educated, we're just definitely losing chemicals or our environment. So we have to get people thinking about what they're doing, uh, especially our neighbors, you know, we're, we're having... Uh, this issue here all the time. Uh, you know, in Reading, I was a conservation officer for 25 years. And we had some really heated battles about uh, ball fields. And the thing is that they wanted to put in new ball fields at the schools and they, uh, they involved lots of use of pesticides to develop the turf. And when I asked the applicants to bring me the names of the uh, uh, chemicals that were gonna be used on these fields, um, it was it was um, Agent Orange, uh, the stuff they were using in Vietnam. I mean, come on, you know, don't you read the newspaper? You're going to put little eight-year-old kids uh, from school on a on a field treating Agent Orange. So I was labeled a uh, kid hater in my town, even though I had a couple of kids myself. And uh, you know, this is these, these big battles in our community. Some some of the stuff about uh, chemical use and. You know, when you look at that, we were at a, a house in uh, New Canaan, Connecticut, where the guy was quite nature minded and he had a couple of acres and he made it into a uh, lightning bug preserve. And over 40 years, he's, you know, studied lightning bugs and made plantings. And uh, two years ago, we just had the most phenomenal lightning bug summer. And right next to it was this house that was totally manicured and the lightning bugs in the dark night, not one lightning bug could be found over the lawn. While when you were look, turned to look at his property, it was like a, a fireworks display. So, um, you know, this is, I mean, this guy probably has a very good education and uh, he's not thinking about, you know, what he's doing away with. Uh, you know, bird houses, uh, you know, have promoted uh, birds to some degree. Uh, and it's a big deal making bird houses and selling bird, bird houses, uh, you know. And uh, what I've done here, I'm trying to promote pollinators on my property. And for the first six weeks of uh, spring and summer, 
I let my lawn grow. I set my, uh, my uh, lawn mower very high and I let some of these flowers develop. I mow the lawn later in the summer, but the amount of pollinators uh, coming onto my yard now is pretty impressive, uh, especially since we did our survey last year. And I make bee houses. Uh, I'm sure you've seen the little uh, bees, uh, the little plugs, uh, things that get plugged with mud and stuff around your house. Uh, well, anyway, that those are where bees are depositing their eggs and larvae. And uh, I made little houses to promote that. So, and I put about 10 of these around my property. And here's a unbelievably beautiful uh, uh, sweat bee going in to uh, colonize one of these uh, tubes. Uh, and there's a whole thing about making bee houses. You can study that, learn about that online. But this guy is, or girl, is in your backyard, I guarantee it. You just haven't looked at the uh, you know, size. They're small, but when you realize they're there and you start to see them, absolutely beautiful iridescent green. So this is come some of our uh, variety of native bees. You can see the green one on the right and uh, just really fascinating what's going on out there uh, once you start to pay attention. The uh, bumblebees in the middle and the, so and the uh, sweat bees on the outside. So I was just going to go over, uh, you know, I, uh, for a living, I am a, a, I studied entomology in college and my spouse and I have traveled all over Africa and South America, providing uh, about 30,000 specimens for the Peabody Museum at Yale. But uh, my passion and life, how I made a living, how I made the dollar was uh, running a paint company, uh, Monarch Painting, Metamorphosis is our business. And we did a decorative work, uh, decorative style painting. An idea I've been working, if any of you are artistically inclined, here we are at the, our lab at the Peabody Museum at Yale, and we have an empty wall there. And that door goes into where one and a half million insects are housed, our collection, which is a world standard collection uh, called the Insect Morgue, unfortunately. And here it is a little bit later after I showed up one day with my brush and uh, did one of my uh, little mini murals uh, with selfies and uh, talk a little just about kids. But, I, you know, I love the monarch. Uh, I named my company Monarch Painting. Our, our motto is metamorphosis is our business. Uh, so it's really worked uh, wonderful, the monarch as my uh, logo. And I teach uh, a class every summer to children. And uh, the children did this mural. Now, if, if your teacher's in, in the audience, you know you gotta work with the kids. And kids now have these phones uh, much better than anything I have. So I get them on their phone right away. They, I have them take pictures of each other and then I show them how to make them into silhouettes. So these are actual silhouettes on the wall of, girl, of those girls that they, uh, as a group, selected two of the girls to actually have the silhouettes. Uh, they, they take pictures of themselves, they take selfies, they love taking selfies, and then they email them to our art guild and they put them on the copy machine and then I show them how to blow them up. Uh, and there they are with the monarch butterflies. In one week, these kids who mostly have never painted anything paint this mural and no one is more shocked than they are. And by the end, they come in the first day and they're just like jaded like. 12 year olds and 14 year olds could be. And then by the end of the week, they are so excited when they see their creation developing that I can't even touch their project. If I you know, try to fix a, a spot on the wing or something, I get yelled at, I'm, I'm put back in the, uh, in, in, you know, in the, in the locker room. A uh, woman on the left wrote, um, she became a very articulate. During the course of the week, we talked a lot about the, uh, Biology of the monarch. There's a garden at the gill. We went out and actually saw monarchs flying around. So these kids were really getting a nice uh, natural history lesson along with their painting. And when the newspaper came to interview us at the end of the week, uh, Ruby on the left became our spokesman and gave a wonderful rendition of the uh, monarch situation, which I kind of know. Uh, there the little girls holding Emma, our dachshund. Now, uh, I this is my uh, field, my the entrance to my meadow in Reading, Connecticut. And again, I'm using that, beating that monarch uh, uh, motif to the death, the different things we do with the monarch and the butterflies. When I 
I was excited after doing that, and I decided to do my studio over. I put a monarch on the side of my studio, and that's when my wife said, look, you got to stop with the butterflies. Uh, you know, people don't put butterflies on houses, and, uh, you know, you already did one, so just, you know, lighten up, will you? So that was the last time I got to paint a butterfly on a house. And we're going to leave the meadow now. We finished. We've been there for the summer, seen some of the activity that's going on, some of the biology that's driving uh, some of the events that are, are happening. And this is the meadow at the end of the summer when the grass is over your head. It's really, this is right before we cut it. You can see actually we started cutting it on the right and my children were still children. Uh, you know, it's being a butterfly family it hasn't been all good and sometimes you wonder about if you did the right thing my daughter there here i have them out in the shell creek range in uh, nevada in a beautiful meadow and uh my daughter said to me recently who's now in her 30s she said you know i wasn't until i was a teenager that i realized that all families didn't chase butterflies on vacation so um i guess you know you rub off on your children some way so anyway, uh, this is a butterfly nose job. Uh, butterflies, like everything, like salt. So you get a nice sweaty character out there in the summer and a butterfly can land and start to sip that salt. Now the butterflies sometimes are like it. This guy had to have that butterfly on for about two hours. So he was getting uh, pretty, uh, pretty, pretty tired of having the butterfly stuck to his face. But that's the rule on a butterfly nose job. You have to wait until it's ready to have him sipping the salt in his sweat. So that's the end of it. And if you have any questions, you want to put them on chat, I will read them and then answer them. Okay. Let me see here. Okay, now, uh, okay, are there any questions, uh, Diane? Am no, I still Victor, on? I don't see any questions in the chat. Oh, wait, nope, there's right now, uh, there's a question from Ginny. Okay. Where are you, where, okay, why don't you read it to me? Sure. How do you get rid of invasives? Oh my God, you spend your, you know, we are uh, with our meadow, we are battling uh, invasives left and right. Uh, it's a never ending process. And it's, you know, uh, this world trade, you know, everything has really uh, accelerated it. And I'm sure down in New York there, you have all the dead ash trees. Uh, we have every single ash tree in Connecticut is dead. So there's a tremendous amount of the forest now that is, filled with skeletons and actually getting to the point where I think it's going to cause uh, problems because the uh, uh, emerald ash borer killed all the ashes about uh, four years ago. Do you have a lot of dead ash trees down there? Has it struck there yet, the plague? No? No answer? Can you hear me, Diane? Yes, I can hear you. And uh, Ginny said yes to that question. Okay. So that's, uh, but invasive species, it's the, it's, you know, I think it's really the uh, tribulation of our time. So you do the best you can. But we've managed to, you know, keep our meadow pretty good shape. I mean, even with all these challenges, uh, we keep at it, but we've kept it the way it is. And, uh, you know, as we've seen a lot of other meadows go the way of lawn and things like that. Uh, and we have another question here. It looks like, where can I get swamp milkweed? Uh, well, uh, we, we gave swamp milkweed out. We gave, uh, my daughter organized a program where we gave more than a hundred species of, uh, I mean, a hundred people, uh, four species of milkweeds. Uh, some of them are land trusts, some of them are individuals over, uh, 25% of the towns in Connecticut and some places in New Jersey and New York. So if you contact me, uh, next winter, or early, early uh, spring, uh, we might be able to supply you some, uh, no charge at all, unless you're gonna give us a little a dollar or two for postage. Other than that, uh, if you're gonna pursue local um, places for swamp milkweed, uh, I would look into the pollinator pathway if it's down there and, and, and question someone there who might na know native suppliers. 
of native plants. It's really become a big thing now. Uh, so I don't think you should have that much trouble uh, finding it. But as I said, my name is Victor DeMassey. I have a website for my painting business. So you can contact me through that or you can contact me at victormonarch at yahoo.com and we will supply you swamp milkweed from our meadow of seed. My swamp milkweed are just, the ones I've been planting over the last two years, are, they're just really starting to bloom and they're, they're just spectacular. Okay, Victor, thank you. We have another question here. Can you please okay. recommend other plants that are easy to grow that will attract pollinators? Okay, well, one of the plants, and I, you know, this is kind of a, a plant of, uh, of a forest edges and moist areas, but not wetlands, is black cohosh. Uh, black cohosh, uh, it has a really powerful flower spike six feet high. Uh, it's the food plant of the uh, Appalachian azure, which is a rare butterfly in Connecticut, uh, probably more common down your way. And uh, deer don't eat it. Uh, which is a big thing, uh, and it grows in shady to partly sunny conditions. So black cohosh, I would uh, recommend. The milkweeds are good. You don't have to. You have to protect your milkweeds from monarchs, especially the first year, because the monarchs prefer uh, young plants because uh, the young plant has less chemicals developed for protection. Uh, the reason the plants get have chemicals is to protect them from things that would eat them like monarchs. So this is a kind of an ongoing battle. The monarchs uh, prefer the plants that have less uh, toxin uh, for their caterpillars to have to process. So you have to protect your young plants, uh, your young milkweeds, or the monarchs will lay eggs and they'll eat them to the ground. Once you get your milkweeds going, uh, they're pretty good and they're very competitive with a lot of other uh, plants. So they're gonna take less uh, maintenance, they're more field uh, worthy. And lastly, that red plant at the beginning, um, bee bombs are pretty aggressive, absolutely beautiful and great nectar sources. Uh, they're for drier sites and stuff, but they will multiply. So that's a good one to uh, throw in the mix too. Uh, and I, you can get bee bombs commonly at plant suppliers, preferably native plant suppliers. I'm sure there's some down in New Jersey. I mean, in uh, New York and New Jersey for that matter. So that's all right. A few of them. Well, that's all the questions we have tonight, Victor. Okay. So thank you very much for the program. It was very informative. Okay. Well, thank you, Diane, for hosting. Have a nice evening and a great summer and good luck with your native plantings. <laughs>